One of the great discoveries in history, of course, is the double helix structure of DNA, which was discovered in the 1950s by analysis of X-ray diffraction patterns. That was right when computational imaging was beginning to emerge. People began to understand uh, that you could analyze the scattered field, but not the field, the magnitude squared of the field, and then reconstruct objects from that. Uh, this recent work uh, uh, shows a, a rotationally blurred average diffraction pattern on the left, and then a three-dimensional reconstruction of the double helix of DNA uh, on the right. This is done uh, with phase retrieval, and that's our topic for today. Computational imaging. Episode 29, phase retrieval. Here's the simplest version of a phase retrieval problem. We have two modes. We have uh, light coming here, let's say, and light coming here, two simple modes. And we want to figure out the relative phase of these modes. So we're going to interfere them. So here we'll put a beam splitter. And uh, the modes would be divided here. So some of each mode goes in this direction, and some of each mode goes in this direction. Uh, and then we'll make this into a mock sender interferometer. So we put mirrors here and here. Light comes, comes here, comes here, and uh, we recombine the modes here. Now we have two ports, and on, on each of these two ports, uh, we have uh, the amplitude of mode one, let's say F1, uh, plus the amplitude of mode two, and we'll put some kind of modulation on the amplitude of F2. And here we'd have F1 plus E times F2. So A and B, of course, are, are relative values. Each mode has been modulated in its amplitude and its phase. And we want to set uh, those uh, coefficients A and B in ways that allow us to recover the relative phase of modes one and two. Here's the mathematical form of the problem. Uh, we have uh, described the two modes by amplitudes F1 and F2 and a relative phase of phi. Uh, we can't measure the global phase. What we measure, of course, is a magnitude of H times F squared. So any global phase is lost when we take that uh, magnitude. But we'd like to recover those three values, F1, F2, and phi. Uh, we can do that uh, with any uh, combination of F1 and F2. Here we've uh, split the modes uh, with this uh, sine theta, cosine theta, so that the uh, energy in the, the modes is conserved, but we can split them between the two paths in the interferometer with some relative phase delay uh, psi. Now, if we make only uh, two measurements uh, to recover the three values, F1, F2, and phi, uh, we'll find uh, that would be uh, challenging. So we make this measurement for multiple settings of the interferometer. For example, here we've got three different settings of the interferometer. In the first case, uh, we would measure just the, the magnitude of F1 and the magnitude of F2 uh, with this uh, uh, value of H. Uh, and then we make a second measurement where we measure the sum of the modes and the difference of the modes. And then we measure the mode 1 plus uh, mode 2 delayed by pi and mode 2 delayed by minus pi. And then we normalize this whole thing so that as we make multiple measurements, we're using the same amount of, of total power. So for different values of H, we'll have different success in uh, determining the relative amplitude and phase of the modes. If we take this H, uh, then we get uh, this set of linear equations in our measurements. Uh, if we solve for F1 squared, F2 squared, and then we think of the values uh, F1, F2 cosine phi and F1, F2 sine phi, as different variables, then we have a set of linear equations in these quadratic forms, and solving those linear equations is a method that's closely related to what's called a phase lift, a technique that was developed by Emmanuel Candes at, at, at Stanford. So we can solve these equations for uh, F1, F2, and then uh, we can evaluate how well we accurate, how well we can uh, estimate those values uh, using the uh, kramer al uh, bound analysis that we uh, discussed back in, in chapter two. Uh, so in the uh, GitHub code that comes with this, this course, uh, there's an evaluation of the kramer al bounds uh, for evaluation for analysis of F1, F2 uh, for this particular uh, set of measurements. Um, now, it turns out that the accuracy with which we can estimate um, the mode amplitudes and the, and the phase is related to the quantum limit of basically a, a mean square error of one photon per mode, which we discussed in our last discussion uh, relative to holography. And so here we're evaluating uh, those errors relative to that quantum limit. So in the, here uh, we find that the Kramer outbound, uh, which is evaluated 
uh, using the uh, the formula for a Poisson process, which we discussed uh, when we uh, talked about Kramer Rao balance in chapter two. Uh, for F1, uh, depends on the ratio of F1 uh, to F2, and so you see this this set of curve uh, for various values of the relative phase, uh, and then we have uh, this this uh, uh, Kramer L balance for estimation of phi, uh, similarly for for various values of, of uh, phi itself. So it's actually you know obviously pretty accurate for this uh, uh, value of, of h, and uh, if if we make uh, h more sophisticated, we can get closer and closer to the, the fundamental quantum limit. Uh, this uh, analysis of just phase retrieval on two modes uh, is central to, to applications such as gravity wave detection, where uh, you try to evaluate the, the path difference between two arms and detect uh, gravity wave modulations of that path difference. In the case of uh, gravity wave uh, detection, the, the error is going to be one photon for standard techniques, so the signal-to-noise ratio would be one over the square root of the number of photons uh, that you measure. And so uh, in gravity wave detection, extraordinary efforts are made to improve this effort or improve this uh, uh, resolution uh, by using prepared quantum states. And if you go to a, a prepared quantum state, uh, you can do uh, better uh, than the uh, uh, coherent state uh, error that you get when, when the system is not squeezed. Uh, we won't be interested in that here. We're more interested in uh, how do we use this in imaging system, which means we want to go to M modes and just, instead of just two modes. So the general phase retrieval problem is that uh, F could be a, a vector with arbitrarily many modes. It could be a, a megapixel image, in which case we need to figure out uh, the relative phase of all points within the image. Once again, uh, we have no method to figure out the global phase of the system, but we can figure out the relative phase of every pair of points uh, you know, F, F1, F, Fn plus 1. Uh, and it turns out in the presence of Poisson noise that the mean square error for a system consisting of n modes is n, so an error of basically one photon uh, per mode. Uh, we discussed last time uh, holographic solutions to figuring out F, which would involve uh, adding a reference beam. Uh, in the case of uh, phase retrieval, uh, we don't have a global reference to add. We're going to use self-interference between the uh, components of the field and try to figure out the relative phase like we did with the two modes. And that means that we can just set this val this uh, transformation matrix H in ways uh, that allow us to, to get to uh, uh, the quantum limit. Now, um, it turns out that uh, um, the same is for, for two modes that, you know, one simple measurement of, of H is, is not generally sufficient. You need to oversample uh, the field uh, with multiple interference terms to recover the phase. So this, this paper on uh, quantum limited uh, uh, phase retrieval shows that if you have uh, enough uh, connections over uh, enough distance across the field, uh, you can recover the phase uh, to values approaching the quantum limit. If you do something like a shearing interferometer, where, for example, you measure the, the relative phase between adjacent points, so you measure the, the links here are supposed to show that uh, you have a point uh, A and it's interfering with points uh, you know, B and C, and by forming these connections or, or terms in the H matrix that, that collect interference, uh, you get more and more information to allow you to recover the phase. Uh, to, have to recover the phase stably, you need longer term connections rather than just simple shearing uh, interferometry. Uh, you can analyze, uh, you know, how well uh, you do in phase retrieval based on the number and structure of the samples. And if you sample uh, sufficiently well, uh, then you can show that it's possible to build a encoding system, an H matrix, that allows you to uh, approach the uh, quantum limit of one photon per mode, uh, even as the number of signal elements or the number of modes uh, grows large. Um, this kind of connection is, is not practically done. What we'll talk about in the next uh, uh, sequence of, of discussions is uh, practical encoding methods that allow uh, phase retrieval. Um, and now, rather than just the quantum limits, of course, we want to look at what kind of algorithms would we use uh, for phase retrieval. So in the classical problem, you have something exactly like what we showed in the introduction, uh, that you measure the magnitude of some scattered field, and now uh, you need to process that and estimate uh, the object that created that uh, that field. Uh, the classical algorithm is called uh, error reduction or the gershberg saxton algorithm. Uh, in this case, uh, you, it could be that you measured the magnitude of the object field and the magnitude of the Fourier transform of the object field, or you could have measured the magnitude of the Fourier transform and have some constraint on the object, such as the object uh, exists over a region of finite support. 
and then uh, you solve uh, for the unknown phase by alternating uh, between regions, for, the, for example, the image space and the Fourier space. So if you know the measured amplitude, uh, you add some phase to that amplitude, inverse Fourier transform into the object space, apply some constraints such as the measured amplitude or the measured or the known support of the object. Uh, and after you apply that constraint, you keep the phase that you've got estimated, but then you inverse Fourier transform back into the Fourier transform space where you now have an estimate of the amplitude and the phase. You keep the phase estimate from the algorithm, but correct the amplitude to the known amplitude and repeat this algorithm iteratively, and it can be shown to, to converge on the uh, correct solution uh, for the system. Um, there can be improved versions of this algorithm. Here, for example, we're looking at the hybrid input-output algorithm that was developed by, by Jim Fina. Uh, this uh, algorithm uses a relaxation parameter, so rather than just fully uh, correcting the, the field to match the constraint, you have this relaxation parameter beta. Uh, this is implemented in the uh, GitHub code that's supplied with the course, uh, where we have uh, the measured uh, Fourier transform hat f, uh, and we're going to add to that uh, a phase estimate that we uh, iteratively uh, correct. Now, in this case, um, the uh, constraint is that the reconstructed field uh, is real and, and non-negative. So that you could have many different possible constraints, support constraints, or other constraints. This particular example is implementing this idea that the estimated field has to be real and non-negative. So if the field is negative, uh, then uh, we, we apply this relaxation correction to, uh, to try to improve our estimate uh, of, of the field. Um, if, the, uh, if the field uh, matches the support constraint, they leave it unchanged, and then we go through this uh, process for a, a, a cycle of estimates and find that the uh, field relaxes to an accurate estimate of the uh, unknown phase and amplitude. In this uh, code you know, provided, this algorithm is implemented, implemented on the uh, minced uh, digits in this case, so, so here's a, a digit. This is it, it's a, a Fourier transform, um, you know, kind of uh, blown up, and then this this is the uh, um, iterative solution to that. And you see that we recover uh, the object through this algorithm. Uh, the object is shifted in space, and that that's due to the unknown uh, phase. That, that there's a phase factor that could cause the the Fourier transform uh, position to shift. So the the reconstruction is physically accurate. Uh, but shifted uh, in shifted spatially. So I invite you to go and, and play with that uh, code and understand this hybrid input output uh, algorithm. Now, uh, the problem that you have here is if you uh, just, for example, measure the Fourier transform of the scattered field uh, and have a support constraint, uh, it may be uh, difficult for this algorithm uh, to converge because basically you don't have enough information that you need to oversample uh, the system to have enough constraints to uh, rigorously solve this uh, phase retrieval problem. Uh, one technique for increasing the amount of information in the system is to uh, modulate the field. So in, this is equivalent to what we did where we took multiple H matrices for the two system, the, the two mode system. We can have the unknown field and we could, we could modulate the Fourier transform, for example, by using the spatial light modulator to modulate the phase before we take the Fourier transform. So if we take multiple measurements under different known modulation conditions, uh, then we can implement the phase retrieval algorithm, but satisfying the constraint um, with multiple versions of the, of the transformation. And this makes the system better conditioned and will tend to converge better. Uh, you can explore uh, this kind of approach uh, using these algorithms that are uh, very conveniently produced by uh, the University of Maryland. The phase pack uh, is a MATLAB family of algorithms for implementing phase retrieval. Uh, if you go to their site, um, they implement uh, you know, the hybrid input-output algorithm labeled here as the FENIP algorithm, gershberg saxton and then over the, over the years, uh, many, many different phase retrieval algorithms have been proposed, and here's you know, comparisons of them where in this case you're measuring just the, uh, the Fourier transform of the field and supplying a support constraint. If you use the Fourier coding masks, uh, then you see um, you know, uh, that uh, the reconstruction can be much more complex. And here uh, you're recovering an uh, image, rather, you know, which would be large scale, in this case, I think 512 by 512 uh, pixels and recovered uh, you know, very accurately. 
More recently, of course, uh, people have begun to look at neural algorithms uh, for phase retrieval. Uh, this is uh, you know, very similar to the uh, gershberg saxton algorithm, uh, but rather than uh, uh, using a, uh, uh, you know, a, a simple uh, a support constraint, you use a constraint that the system has to be reconstructed by a, a, a neural network. So this is kind of a regression under the constraint that a neural estimator is used uh, to, to form the image. And so again, it will go uh, regressively through this, but train the network uh, to uh, minimize error and uh, satisfy the constraints on, on reconstruction. So this is comparison for this uh, SciNet, in a particular uh, uh, deep image prior. So basically, uh, and a reconstruction under the constraint that the system has to be uh, reconstructed by a, uh, a unit. Uh, comparing here, um, you know, the, the, first of all, the image is A, the diffraction pattern, uh, you know, uh, uh, C is uh, back propagation, D is using Gershberg Saxton to try to uh, you know, estimate the phase, uh, E is using the transport of intensity equation, and, and F is the uh, the neural estimator, which uh, produces somewhat better image. And so this is experimental data uh, from, from that system showing uh, a neural estimator. Uh, we will look at uh, neural estimators uh, again uh, when we start to look at uh, compressive uh, image reconstruction, uh, which is gets to the problem of how do we go from the scattered pattern to the three-dimensional images, which is what you see on the right. Estimation of uh, three-dimensional objects from uh, scattered coherent fields is called uh, diffraction tomography, and that's the topic of our next lecture.